as we are careful to occupy the place behind the sacred desk to bring the Word of God to us, I invite you to turn to Romans 12 and verse 13. to verse 10 and then read through verse 13. Follow along then, beginning at Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Of the many instances throughout my 38 years as a Christian that I was shown hospitality by believers all around the world, from Nigeria to England to America and many other countries, one instance of hospitality shown to me stands out in my mind in particular. It was about seven or eight years ago when we were visiting with friends at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, Spurgeon's old church. Its pastor, Dr. Peter Masters, invited us to his home. And God has truly rested his blessing <clears throat> upon this church. There are over 700 members and they have many thriving ministries, most of which are their spiritual activities, such as the prayer meeting, the worship services, the communion services, and their evangelism ministries. And though Dr. Masters is a man used greatly of God all around the world through his various ministries, television, radio, many books written. The Wakeman Trust, their printing ministry, publishes many, many books. And the impact of his ministry is felt all around the world. Yet, when I was invited to his home, myself and two or three other members of Christ Bible Church that were with our party. What I saw was a very humble man who in his very four, small four-cylinder car drove me to his flat, which they call an apartment in America, he lived in a small flat in London, and he and his wife served us. And after a full day's ministry where he preached two sermons, and then after the evening service is finished, where he delivers his second message, he goes into his study, and there's a long waiting, uh, there's a waiting room with a lot of people waiting to counsel with him. So he's really not done until about 8 p.m. after an hour and a half or two hours of counseling. This is after preaching twice that day. And his wife, when we arrived at the Apartment looked exhausted and I couldn't help but notice that as they begin to wait on us they told us to sit, sit down and asked us and they had some sandwiches and finger foods and coffee and they waited on us hand and foot they would not let us lift a finger I'll never forget leaving his apartment that night how blessed and edified I was by their hospitality, their meekness, their lowly attitude as servants of the Lord. And so today's message is based on verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. I want to address today the ministries of sharing with the saints and the ministry of hospitality. 
I place the word vital in the title of my message, the vital ministry of serving the saints, because the two ministries I just mentioned in our text are not of little importance. They're not a secondary ministry at Christ Bible Church. They're vital. They are very important. And just by brief way of review, you'll remember that chapter 12 is a chapter full of applications of the first 11 verses to our everyday lives, or the first 11 chapters to our everyday lives as Christians. In verses 1 and 2, which is the linchpin, which is the hinge of the whole chapter and understanding it, we have expressed our relationship to God. And upon that relationship we find in verses 3 through 8 instructions and exhortations concerning our relation or our responsibility to believers. And then in verses 17 through 21 we find instructions concerning our responsibility to our enemies and then divided up among several other verses we have general responsibilities in serving others. These texts are found in verses 9 through 13 and verses 15 and 16. We've already looked at 9 through 12, today we'll look at verse 13 and then next time we'll look at the remaining two verses of these responsibilities we have as Christians in serving others. And then God willing we'll move on to chapter 13. But this brings me to our first point then, which is sharing with needy saints. Verse 13a, sharing with needy saints. We're commanded here that to distribute to the needs of the saints. Now let's look at the word distribute for a minute, or the word distributed in the New King James. The authorized version, the King James may have a different word. I think it says communicating there in the King James. Both of these words are very weak in expressing the original because it doesn't bring out the fullness of the meaning in the Greek word for distributing. Now it's a very important word so I want to linger a little longer on it. It's a verb which expresses action. Those of you who are young people, some of you have grammar classes and some of you like English grammar, some of you don't. But you will remember that a verb expresses action. And so when we talk about distributing, this means that you and I as Christians somehow, some way in understanding and applying this text, we need to be active in doing this. Whatever we are to distribute, we need to be engaged and proactively involved in this very important responsibility. It means, the word distributing here, it means sharing, partaking in, and participating. Therefore, when we help someone, we're doing more than just giving them something and walking away. This word is much deeper and fuller in the sense that our emotions are involved. Our affections are involved in helping to meet other believers' needs, whether it be financially or whether it be otherwise. Whatever the need may be, God commands us here to distribute to who? To the needs of who? The saints. So we're commanded here to give, to distribute, to share with, from our possessions, saints, believers who are in need. This is not an option. But there's more than just bringing a meal on Sunday to give to a sick person. That's important and that's a very good thing. And we love to do that here at Christ Bible Church. I can single out one or two ladies among us who it seems like uh, they should have been a manager for McDonald's because they make a lot of to-go food really well. But of course the quality of the food is much higher than McDonald's, so please, I'm not trying to insult you. But when we talk about distributing to the needs of the saints, when we give food, when we give money, when we share of our wherewithal, 
we give more than the physical thing itself. And that's what God is pointing us to here in this Greek word. In other words, when you help Christians, you are partaking, remember that's the word, you're sharing, you're partaking, you're participating in the fellowship of their needs. Because there's a fellowship of suffering. There's a fellowship of needs. Fellowship means a relationship, an interaction, emotionally and spiritually, with another believer. Now God says there's a fellowship of meeting needs. And therefore, the financial or physical need itself is limited. The idea of distributing or sharing transcends the actual transference of the money from one hand to another. To a person who's in need. When we help Christians, we're partaking with them in the fellowship of their need. We talk with them about their need. We get a sense of where they're at emotionally and spiritually because of the pressure and the stress and the burden that the need has caused in their life. They need more than just money. They need sympathy. They need intercession. They need true spiritual koinonia, true fellowship. They need, to, they need to feel that I'm sympathizing with them. They need to see that I'm engaged in fulfilling another commandment of Christ, which is inherent in this duty of distributing to the needs of the saints. It's called bear one another's burden. And let me tell you something. I know some poor believers, some poor Christian single and, and married employees in this church. And this idea of that financial obligation weighing upon them week after week, month after month, not knowing whether they're going to have enough money to pay their bills, not knowing whether they're going to be able to meet their fixed expenses, let alone discretionary spending that month, is, is a burden on their hearts. Amen? And I need to help lift that burden. This is called the fellowship of sharing with them and their needs. Not only giving them a dollar and say, go buy yourself a cup of coffee, I hope you feel better, but it's about entering in with them. You know, the hour or two hours you spend with them, fellowshipping with them, helping them lift the pressure of the burden, and praying with them sometimes is more important than helping them financially. Amen. But we do need to do the first works first as well, that is helping to lighten their physical load as well. This is closely related, this word for distributing to the Greek word koinonia. It's, it's, a, it's a, a derivative from the root word koinonia, which is the word for fellowship. It's the same word as we find, for example, in the apostolic benediction in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, which I often repeat at the end of the service. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. That word communion, same word as distributing or sharing with the needs of the saints. There's an intimate exchange of fellowship during the help that you give with another believer that alleviates the spiritual burden that the need has caused in their life. So God is saying that you don't merely give brethren some money and go your way, but that you enter into fellowship with them. You become partners with them. You share with them, spiritually, emotionally, and otherwise. In other words, you must feel the burden they have because of the need they have. That you're feeling hardship with them. You say, well, it's hard for me to feel because I, you know, I've, I'm a middle class or upper class believer. I don't have financial need. I don't have a need of good health because I'm in good health. Half, a third of our church basically lives in a spiritual hospital where most of them are praying every day, take away my pain, lighten my physical load. We're called to enter into those burdens that they have physically, medically, and otherwise. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true financially. We, we share in a fellowship 
It's a fellowship not only of rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ and edifying one another because of who we are as Christians and what we have experienced in terms of salvation, the fellowship of the Word of God, the fellowship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also have a fellowship horizontally in lifting each other's burdens and meeting the needs of the saints whenever those needs arise. And it's more than just a physical meeting of the needs. You're kind of sharing their situation with them in their need. If we don't realize this, we'll miss the important teaching that God has for us here in this doctrine. This is a very important component of the doctrine of the church. It's closely related to the use and exercise of spiritual gifts and other doctrines that are connected with edifying the body, those duties and activities and responsibilities that we engage in to build up the body. This is a very important one where we distribute, we partake, we participate, we share our belongings, our finances, not hoarding, not hoarding, our wherewithal away in some Swiss bank account or some savings account because we're thinking like a financial analyst rather than a Christian not hoarding our resources but sharing and giving so Pastor Joe here you go again okay all right so often our doctrine comes in direct opposition with the American dream or with the wisest wisdom of the financial the greatest financial counselors because a lot of that advice tends to cause believers to sin by hoarding. God has called out, look, our riches are stored up in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, is it wrong to have a 401k or a retirement plan? No, it's not. But you need to be ready at any time to take out of it or give up the whole thing if the Lord would call you to it. Because our riches are not in this world. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not complaining. I rejoice that I don't have a savings account. In 24 years as the pastor of this church, there's no retirement account for me. And I think that's providential because it blends with our philosophy of a faith ministry. I don't need that temptation constantly in the back of my mind. Slow down, Joe. The church has given you a retirement account. Slow down. Take it easy. You don't have to be diligent and everything you do. If I wasn't diligent, the blessing of God would be removed. God would see that I'm lazy. I'm not diligent as a pastor. And I would not be blessed either way. Thank God that I don't have to worry about the temptation of resting on my laurels because I've got a retirement account that's been accumulating for 24 years. And that's part of my security so I can slow down every once in a while. Now for another pastor, it may be different. He could be just as diligent or even more so than me with a full retirement account waiting for him once he retires. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a retirement account, but just like anything of this world, you better not become attached to it, too attached to it, because it could sink you. It could hurt your ministry and your service to the Lord. So I'm, I'm just rejoicing. I'm not nervous that... Whether or not we get enough offering in the box today or next week, the Lord has provided for 24 years, has even increased the giving. We don't pass an offering plate around. We don't put a statistic up in our bulletin or on the wall like some churches do. What was given last week, what, what we need to have today to make our monthly budget and to pay our pastor. Finances are hardly ever mentioned, maybe three or four times in the last 15 years. And that's okay. That's a good thing. In our sophisticated, educated world of finance, where we've got prosperity down to a science, and everyone is hoarding and storing up and laying up treasures on earth, even in the church, could there possibly be a handful of Christians who would still live by faith and trust in God and not have to work 70 hours plus a week to fulfill some hoarding goal that the wisest Christian analyst, financial analyst said you should be doing? 
And then the day after, or the week after, or the month after your retirement, you die. You don't have time to spend any of it, and you leave it for somebody else. Meanwhile, the last 30 years that you've been living, storing up all those treasures and riches on earth, you've given up all your discretionary time in walking with the Lord. Your basic spiritual life is reduced to just hearing a sermon on Sunday and listening to Bible tapes or a Christian radio program on your way to work and praying before your meals. Now that's not the abundant life God has called us to in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the sanctified life. And so many believers in a very surreptitious or subtle or secretive way have bought into that philosophy. They're deceived and they've made a major, major change in their lifestyle to follow the dollar, to follow money, rather than God. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, sharing with believers who are in need points us to a foundational doctrine, which is the doctrine of good works. Of course, I hasten to say that we're not saved by our works. But our works are an evidence or fruit of our faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should. Thank you. But the doctrine of good works is an important element in our sanctification. We're not to be passive about good works. For example, in the book of James, turn with me, James chapter 2. And this idea of good works very much relates to the past two messages about being zealous for God and fervent in spirit when we serve the Lord. The same is true in our everyday Christian life. When we walk with the Lord, when we serve the Lord in whatever capacity He has called us to, we are to do so by diligently performing good works. In James 2 and verse 1 we read, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For the, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Now the groundwork is laid. And God is saying, look, don't show favoritism in the church. Now this is especially true with regard to distributing to the needs of the poor. There are many poor people at Christ Bible Church. As a matter of fact, this reflects the ratio and proportion between poor, middle class, and rich made up of most churches throughout the history of the world. Why? Because believers are usually called from the lowest, poorest classes in life. The prostitutes, homeless people, drug dealers, alcoholics, People have wasted their living with riotous, sinful activity. But in spite of that, God usually draws from the poorest among us. And that usually is a reflection of the percentage and makeup of rich and poor in the church. So we're not to show favoritism. We're to actually look out among our members and visitors and attendees and be mindful of those who are poor. Don't turn a blind eye. Don't give a cold shoulder, a hardened heart to those who are in need. The second a need is known, 
among the needy in the church, we should have three or four people responding to that need. There should not be one homeless person among the saints as long as we have one person with an apartment and a couch or a floor to sleep on. There should not be one church member who can't pay their rent, who can't put food on the table. As long as we have one member with a savings account who has extra above and beyond their income that they use to pay their bills. Right? Show me in the Bible where I'm wrong. But James 2 continues. Down, look down at verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now this is set on the heels of poor people who are in need and not showing favoritism to the rich against them and their needs. What does it profit, brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The Bible teaches, if you keep reading in James 2 and 3, that works always accompany genuine faith. You never have true Christian faith without works issuing from that bona fide faith. The two always go together, though we are not justified by works. Like I said, the works are the evidence that we are saved, not the grounds of our salvation. And over in Hebrews chapter 13, turn to Hebrews 13. And in verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. God is saying do good works, that is do good, but he adds another phrase, to share. That is the things that you have. You're to share them with those who are in need. You're not to be thinking, like some people, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. <laughs> that's how some people think. Of course, that's the philosophy of the world. Dog eat dog, always striving and grappling and groping for more, for more, for more. And when the millionaire gets the first million, he's not happy. He goes for the second. When he gets the second, it's like a challenge to go to the tenth million, the hundredth million. And then when he reaches his first billion, here's another new challenge. I'm on another new level. I gotta start over again. I gotta get the second billion, then the tenth billion. Then the... They're never satisfied. An insatiable desire for the stuff of this life. God have mercy on them. If that is their outlook, where they see people and things and jobs as just stepping stones to get more things out of this life, God says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, now watch, that they may be rich in good works. Ready to what? Give. Ready to give, not neutral. So when an opportunity presents itself, you're struggling, you're grappling to get your perspective spiritually and doctrinally speaking on this opportunity to give. No, you should be ready to give. Your disposition should be one of wanting to give at every opportunity. Verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. The clear implication of that last statement in verse 19 is, is that the good works of believers follow them. Every good, do, good work you do in the name of the Lord that is owned and blessed by the Spirit where God is in that good work follows you and lays a bigger and stronger foundation for the life to come in some way. Titus 2 Turn with me to Titus. There's a theology of good works in the book of Titus I want you to notice. 
Titus 2, 13 and 14. Titus 2, 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We learned the last two sermons about the importance of zeal. That zeal is to be applied to our responsibility in doing good works. And this verse also teaches that there is a goal that our Lord's death on the cross has, not just to save us from our sins, but to have us become holy, to purify for Himself His own special holy people who have been redeemed from every lawless deed. And then at the end of the matter, for the rest of their lives, they are growing in holiness and they are continuing zealously in good deeds. This is the opposite picture that we find in many churches today, where we have a consumer-friendly attitude among many churchgoers and pew-sitters. It seems like the world revolves around them. They are the ultimate goal of all church ministry, to help them feel good, to make them comfortable during the one hour that they serve God a week during their church attendance. And they better feel good when they leave the service, or the church has failed. My Bible teaches that God has designed it, He's ordained it, He's planned it, He's determined it before the world began that the Lord Jesus Christ would save His elect. Not one of them would be lost. And somehow, some way, the teacher, the Holy Spirit, would purify His elect and lay out before them a growing, progressive pathway of holiness. But during that process of holiness, he would put within their hearts an insatiable and growing desire to abound in good works. Good works that take place inside the church in our relationship with one another and good works that take place outside the church. But what, what, is, what are the boundaries and confinements of our life, our spiritual life? and our service to the Lord? Do they consist just basically and barely in attending church activities? And we think that's good enough for God. And even in most of those activities, our hearts are not in it because we don't have time to lay in our faces before God in prayer and imbibe large quantities of the Word to prepare us to come into the house of worship and pour forth this bubbling spirit of desire within us to worship Christ, to praise Him, to thank Him, that barely is restrained up until we enter the church doors, and then once inside is unleashed, once the first prayer is prayed, and the first hymn is sung. That's the picture of the believer's life the believer, the Christian who is devoted and dedicated to serving God and loving God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. This requires time. There's no substitute for the, the number crunching time clock. It requires time. And God have mercy upon his people who because of a love of money, a desire for upward mobility, an ambitious believer looking for uh, the, the corporate ladder to climb, commits himself to a job and a company that will consume like an insatiable monster that is never satisfied more and more and more of his or her time as time goes by. The Bible says that we are to work with our hands, to leave, go home, and be, live a peaceable, quiet life, content in walking with God and serving God. The Bible gives us the picture of working the bare minimum of what we have to work and be content with such things that we have, however little they may be, but it's food on the table. And by the way, it's not a sin to rent an apartment as opposed to buying a house. Even some believers give us the impression, unless you own a house, you're doing something sinful. 
to live as simple and humble a life as we can to devote our life to Jesus Christ so that our earthly contacts and activities are kept to a bare minimum and are just an interruption in our walk with God, our teaching our children and, and our, our families, dwelling with our families in Christ and in the Word and in the knowledge of God and in our serving God through the Church of Jesus Christ and its many activities, prayer meetings, communion service, services. God designed it for our spiritual man to be fully engaged in each one of these spiritual activities. He gave, that's what he gave us affections for, love for, to be poured out to God in secret communion and in public worship during the worship services. God gave us an intellect so that intellect, that mind could be sharpened to a very, very fine point so that when we read the word, we're consuming not only the chapter, the paragraph, the sentence, but we're sucking in and you can hear a great sucking sound. Every word, every syllable, and every letter to be milked of every ounce and drop of spiritual juice that the Holy Spirit will give us and nourish us with from that word. But if we just lazily flip open the Bible randomly and where will I read today and where will I go and oh, I don't understand that and 30 seconds later get discouraged, I don't have time to read the Bible today. The Holy Spirit gave us a mind and this mind is to be developed and cultivated to a razor's edge so we get as much out of our exposition, our study, uh, and our application of and meditation on the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is our life. This book is my life. This book is your life. Communion with God, fellowship with Him, prayer, intercession, supplication, adoration, worship, praise, thanksgiving, that is my life. We have ecclesiastical forms of that, which is the worship service, the communion service, the prayer meeting, the Bible studies, the cell groups. But our hearts would be ready to engage God himself. God himself we engage in our communion with him. This is not an afterthought. This is our life, our very life. And if we neglect the word and prayer, we neglect God. Because he has committed himself. He has ordained it that I will not channel my grace and strength and joy and power through any other means except through a man or a woman filled with the Holy Spirit and truly converted as well as the word of God and prayer. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope. Oh, I already read that. Titus 3.8, the next one. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to both of them. Why do we need to be careful about this, about maintaining the good works, because we can easily stop doing it. There are innumerable temptations and distractions to take us away from the systematic path of devotion in doing good works, to take us away from total commitment and concentration and consecration in doing good works through these various ways the Word of God defines, in serving God through the church, use of spiritual gifts. Anna the prophetess, for example, when she lost her husband, and she was a widow for about, seven, about 65 years. She was upwards of almost 90 years old. Since that time, she served God night and day with prayers in the temple. This was a young woman when she started, and she was an old woman. She maintained a rigid and supernatural consistency 
in engaging in good works and spiritual ministry. So young women, middle-aged and older women can do the same thing. Do you have the desire to do good works like this? Oh, for more Annas. In chapter 3 and verse 14 of Titus it says, And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. This, there's an important thing and connection here. In chapter 3 of Titus, there's a repetition between verse 8 and verse 14. In verse 8 it says, be careful to maintain good works. And then in verse 14 it says, learn to maintain good works. The word maintain there is critical. Like I said earlier, we get sidetracked. God has called us to maintain those good works. It's one thing to do them, it's another thing to maintain a level of consistency in doing them. Are you careful to maintain good works? Or you just don't know what your ministry is, your calling is, your place is? Well, it starts with understanding the doctrine of the church. Understanding the various components and elements of the believer's responsibility to serve God through the church and through the various ministries of the church that God has ordained. The ministry of prayer, God has ordained a prayer meeting for the people of God. We're to continue steadfastly in prayer and we're to maintain those good works. Those of you who have no good reason for not being at the prayer meeting, some of you have a good reason, shame on you, you should be at the prayer meeting. You need to pray, God, give me more desire. Give me a spirit of prayer. Forgive me for making excuses. You need to be at the prayer meeting. You need to maintain good works, especially in the spiritual responsibilities. If it inconveniences you, God promises that he's the, he's the wealthiest man in the world. He will provide for you to fulfill his will and to help you obey. If it requires an extra gallon of gas or an extra half hour, he will give you the grace to do what you need to do. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's the, the owner of everything. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. My God shall supply for all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Mm. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Why do we need to stir up each other to maintain good works. Why do we need to be careful to maintain good works? Because we slacken off. We grow weary. But the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Learn to develop a level of consistency in doing good works. So that instead of being consistent over a month and then you fall back, be consistent over six months. Be consistent over a year. Keep the progress moving forward in terms of your faithfulness in doing good works. That means your, your life can no longer revolve around yourself. You need to be thinking about what, what can I do for others? What is God's will for me in the church? How can I serve? How can I give more? How can I share in the fellowship of giving with other believers? You can't just wake up in the morning and randomly just start thinking about yourself only. Oh, what do I have to do today? Do I have my to-do list, my checklist, and uh, that I read and pray? Okay, that's done. And then I got to go get, get all these things done. And the rest of the day is a race to get your checks checked off on the checklist. And a whole day goes by that you'll never get back again where you don't think about another believer in the church or you don't pray for another believer or you don't do a good work for someone else whether in the church or outside the church, or you don't think about someone else's need, or make a phone call, or send an email, or a text. How can I help you? How are you doing? How's your, how are you feeling? Can I make a meal? Can I come over and pray with you? Can I do this? The Holy Spirit can give you a thousand such suggestive ideas and thoughts if you're just willing, and if you and I will just stop and realize 
and come out of our comfort zone that the world doesn't revolve around me and my getting all my checklists done so that on my deathbed I feel really good about accomplishing things in my family, at my job, and being just a perfect homemaker, a perfect father, a perfect employee. But with God and in serving Him, I got an F on that final report. And therefore, as you're about to enter eternity, that which you measured your life as what is important and what is not in your whole past life, that measure will be replaced with a completely different measure. Now as you enter into eternity, everything you are and do moving forward will be measured by what's your relationship with the Lamb sitting on the throne and those people that are surrounding the throne that are falling down and worshiping Him and casting their good works, casting their crowns, casting their rewards at His feet. What is your relationship with Him? And the only thing you will think about is, number one, do I have His righteousness? Am I saved? And number two, what have I done for Him while I was on the earth? Because now I don't care one bit any longer about anything I did for anybody else and anything else. All those things instantly in their value evaporate as I now redefine everything in the light of the Lamb that is emanating from the throne of the Lamb. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Power! So many of the cries and the wailing and the woes that will issue from a lake of fire and brimstone will be from people who have been deceived and deluded and blind on this very point for their whole life as very fine church members. Because they have no spirit of God in them driving them reminding them, pushing them, you've got to give more for Christ. You've got to do more for Christ. He died for you. He gave his life for you. He gave everything for you. I can't just think about myself. I can't just have the world revolve around me. I can't be living a life of just Joe's instant gratification or my needs and felt needs being met. It's all about Christ. Oh, if the Spirit of God is in you, He's moving you more quickly and more clearly on the pathway of committing more to Christ, surrendering at more, even more than you all already have surrendered to Jesus Christ. And still, you feel you've come up short. But we're commanded to share our earthly resources with believers in need, including finances. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. So many of us are so isolated in our lives and swept up by our daily duties and responsibilities. We become fragmented and disfellowshipped in, in a practical way, not literally, but in a practical way, disfellowship from the communion of the saints and in meeting their needs because we're so isolated and busy. In the early church, most of the believers had a mindset of a community of sharing or of sharing in a community of the believers. The apostles didn't command the Christians in the early church to sell all their possessions and lay them at the apostles' feet. It was the mind of the Spirit which kept driving the believers and causing them to think, what can I do more? What can I give more of myself and my life? More possessions? Lord, okay, I'll sell everything and, let, and give it to you if that's necessary. Of course God is not calling us to do that here at Christ Bible Church, but we need to have an attitude and an outlook that if He would, we need to be ready to do it and not think twice like Lot's wife who looked back because her heart, part of her heart was still in the world, was clinging to something on the earth. So many of our plans are formulated by worldly thinkers, philosophers, financial experts, real estate experts and others who subtly cause us to inculcate 
secretive philosophies that supplant and replace the philosophy of God's Word which says this. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? God have mercy on us. We're to do good especially to the believers. If some of us are given $200 a month to Easter Seals, which is a worthy organization, can't, helping people who have cancer, but we can't give $5 a, a week to, to, to the work of the church to move forward the work of the church and sharing the gospel. Or to, to look at a, a person and, and even inquire, is Pastor Joe, I need to talk to you privately. Is there somebody in the church that is out of work that is not receiving unemployment insurance? Please don't tell anybody. I want to help that person. Here, here's some money for that person. Do we even think about such needs? Is the Spirit of God leading us then to think His thoughts after Him concerning the needs, the financial and physical and spiritual needs of the members of the church that you and I are members of? But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Maybe we've left our first love. Maybe we need to go back and do the first works. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when we... when." Did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did not do it to me. One of the greatest blessings is to be able to give another believer a cool cup of water in the name of the Lord and quench their thirst. And that thirst is a metaphor for whatever need they may have. He who has a generous eye, Proverbs 22, 9 says, will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Luke 16, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon or money, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? If you're hoarding, if you're hardening your heart against the needs of the brethren, if you're approaching the giving of your finances and resources to God and to the church like some hard-hearted businessman, show me where God is going to give you spiritual responsibility. Because God sees you cannot be faithful to Him with this secular resources He's given you. Why should God give you more spiritual responsibility and resources if you can't be faithful with, with these other earthly resources? Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Do you see what God says is part of the reason why he gave you a job? Many of us are quick to praise God and acknowledge that he's the one who gave us our jobs, jobs in which some of us prayed long and hard for, jobs in which some of us shed tears pleading with God for because we were hungry or we were in need or we anticipated a major 
financial catastrophe, if I didn't have a certain amount of money coming in by a certain period of time, and we pleaded for that job and God gave it to us, now all of a sudden we forget about everybody else and everything else. God says once he gave you that job, or now that you have that income, God says you're to work with your hands what is good, a legitimate job. That, or for the purpose of, you may have something to give who has need. So part of your income, God says, is defined by this, that you're to give it to those who are in need. You're to either money or resources. How many of us even bother thinking about that? But we, like clockwork, like a robot, we get our paycheck, whether it's direct deposit or we get a hard check, we take it to the bank, we've got a routine, and it doesn't even enter our minds. Well, maybe I should use a part of this. Maybe I should give to the church. Some church members, perhaps, haven't given to the Lord's work for a month or a year here at Christ Bible Church. Perhaps others have not given to anybody else who is in need. Nothing. Nada. It just doesn't enter their mind. Are some of us so unsanctified, so natural and fleshly in our soul, which we call soulish, so soulish and self-centered that, that the needs of others and the needs of the church and the needs of God doesn't even enter our mind, but we like a routine clockman, we you know, we pay our bills, fixed expenses, and then what's left over, we just kind of sit back and think, how shall I spend this? We put part of it in savings, and here. Wow. Should not spiritual mindedness, the filling of the Spirit, the mind of the Spirit, and the knowledge of the Word of God, guide us into God's will for every single area of our life to show us what the purpose and will of God is for everything we have and everything we do and everything He gives us, including the money He gives us? You say, but I've I got a tight budget. Tell that to the rich widow or the poor widow who put all, everything she had in the bucket in the offering box. She gave everything. She only had two pennies left. I could see her wrestling with people who wanted, like the Pharisees, who wanted her to put those two mites, her last two pennies, and they were really good at taking from widows and poor people. And she's saying, no, 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 that's all I have. If I give you this, I won't have anything left. I'm on a real tight budget. But her love for God caused her to tremble. She had to show it. It's a verb like this word distribute or share. She had to show it by action. She gave everything. She didn't know where her next meal was coming from. Like Abraham, God said, leave your country. Leave your family. Leave her the Chaldees and go out to that desert. And he left not knowing where he was going. A lot of the time, when we give to God, we're going to give when it hurts. Where there's no safety net between us and the giving. Because if you give systematically for a year or two and you get a little faithfulness and consistency under your belt, God will sometimes dry up the coffers and he'll say, let's see if they're going to keep giving. <laughs> if even when it gets close to the budget, going into the, possibly going into the red a little bit. Who's the priority then? Oh, then God goes down on the bottom. I gotta, I gotta pay, you know, God. Hmm? Have you ever been tested in that area? I have, and I'm still tested in that area. I don't know if I'm gonna have a paycheck on the 30th of this, this month. I just trust God, and he works it out. Faith. <coughs> Let, <clears throat> okay. What does it mean to be faithful with your money? Number one, I'm gonna give you a few rules and I'll, I'll finish. I know I'm past my time. Bear with me. What does it mean to be faithful with your money? Those of you who take notes, write this down. Number one, give to uh, God, give to the Lord's work. How many of us give to God last? That's not the way you're supposed to give. What are the rules of giving? Okay, first, first, Christians no longer tithe. This is the New Testament. Tithing was an Old Testament practice of the ceremonial law which Christ fulfilled on the cross. We now give. The responsibility is giving to the Lord's work. The second 
rule of giving to the Lord's work is honor the Lord by first fruits giving. Before you pay any bill, you give to the Lord. You say, but I, I have to figure out how, yeah, figure all that out, but give God first. I have to figure out how, which bills I have to, yeah, do all that. But write the first check to God. Don't let God be the, the leftover. Honor Him by giving Him first. Proverbs 3, 9 and following, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That's part of the moral law. That carries over into the New Testament. Third, give with a cheerful attitude. Attitude is everything with God. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a what? Cheerful, cheerful giver. Give cheerfully. Number four. Give according to your income, your faith, your love, and your desire. You decide here how much to give. But you can't just give while you're shrugging your shoulders. Well, I don't. You use certain principles to decide how much you're going to give. What are those principles? Well, you use... Uh, your income. How much do you get? You only have so much coming in, right? Okay. Number two, faith. You have to have faith in operation while you're giving. Number three, love. When you put your check or dollar or whatever it is in that offering box, don't just say, okay, I, I paid that bill. No. <laughs> Praise God while you're doing it. Thank you. Not just while you're putting the check in there, but during the service, or it's giving is an act of worship, is it not? Praise Him, thank Him, and give with desire, like the widow who went up deliberately and put the money in. Did you see her, like, sneaking up to the offering chest when she was giving her last penny? No, there was bravado there, there was an attitude there of desire. I'm going to give this to the Lord. Stiff up a lift. I love Him. I'm going to trust Him. I'm not saying you should sell everything you have and give it all to Him. I'm not saying that. Fifth, give systematically. Every single time money comes in, I give a certain amount to the Lord. And that amount is between you and the Lord. Systematically. It's not like, well, this month what I get in is mine. Look, God, you've got to take a vacation. I know you own everything anyway. But well, you miss the point, if that's the way you think. Number six, give generously. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, the second aspect about being faithful with your money. First, give to the Lord's work, and we listed six things. The second aspect is pay your bills. Some of you need to hear this. Pay your bills. Don't use credit cards. Pay your bills with money. But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. This assumes that you have fixed bills that you have to pay to provide food and clothing, housing, the basics for you and your family. Pay those bills. And don't think anything else left over is yours. It's not yours. It's still God's, is it not? And you have to use just as much deliberation, determination, and intentional decisions to use that money to the glory of God and wisely you cannot just spend your money on anything you want it's not your money God gave it to you to spend for his glory you need to use some of it for good works that's what the Bible says you need some of it for the work of the church well that's two other bills right there I say bill but it's not really a bill and you decide how much that takes deliberate effort how much Lord well this is how I feel I want to give you a little bit more this time because I love you. I hope I don't sound like a word of faith teacher. <laughs> this is Bible 101. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you now. 
pay your bills. If you have money to pay your bills, pay it now. Or whoever you owe money to, pay it now. Don't put them off because you're thinking, I'll, I'll grow more interest. I'll get more interest out of it if I just pay just a barely, I'll get more money out of it for me. Pay your bills. Number three, don't incur debt. I, can, I could spend three hours on this one because I do a lot of financial counseling. Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm meeting with some people who are Christians and they've gotten themselves in debt and they're buried and it's going to take a while, a while to get themselves out. It's usually very quick we can pile up the debts and the credit card bills, but it takes years, sometimes decades for some people to dig themselves out of long-term debt unless you want to declare bankruptcy. But let me tell you something. If you declare bankruptcy and go take the shortcut, you're bordering on really dishonoring the Lord because you made a commitment and you're dishonoring that commitment. I hope those people who they owe money to don't find out that you're a Christian, that you don't honor your word, honor your commitments and be an ethical, trustworthy person of the faith. I know I'm stepping on some toes, but we need to get our financial house in order. If we're going to be able to do good works and give to others in need, we need to have something to give them, right? If I see a brother or sister in need, I need to distribute to them. I need to share with them. I need to have something to give them. And that presupposes you need to have, and I need to have, our financial house in order. We live in a society where it's dead ridden. This whole ship, this financial ship is going to sink one of these days with a government and its financial institutions that are in collusion with each other, including the, the, the federal, uh, what's the, the federal, uh, what? The federal Reserve is going to go down and we'll be some of the ones laid off because of it. It doesn't take a genius to advise the government and say if you spend more than you have, eventually you're going to go down. You wouldn't do that with your family budget, would you? Spend three times more than you're taking in? I give you three months and you're down, unless you have a padded account somewhere. Don't incur debt. Owe no one anything except to love one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord pictures the Christian as someone who's always giving. If someone asks you for a coat, give him a coat also. It's more blessed to give than to receive. If someone asks you to go a mile, go with them two miles. The pictures of a Christian who's always giving, giving, giving. Not even wanting to receive. But to be able to do giving, 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 you've got to have something to give, right? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and following, we have a promise. We have a wonderful promise that God promises to always give you enough to be able to have a ministry of good works. And I'll end with that. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll conclude a one wonderful promise. Verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give, verse 7, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. This wipes off the map, the Old Testament practice of 10% giving, that pastors scandalously and grievously and sinfully abuse to their own hurt and the hurt of the people of God. This verse teaches that you're the one that decides how much to give. But as long as you give cheerfully, with purpose, and with the right attitude to the glory of God, with love, He accepts it, whether it's a dollar or a million dollars. But you're also to give according to how much He's blessed you with. If you make $1,000 a week and your fixed expenses are $500 a week, and you have $500 left over of discretionary sending, spending, and you give God a dollar of that $500, then that's a problem. we got an attitude or a motivation or motive issue somewhere that hasn't been dealt with. But God is saying here that you give according to as you purpose in your heart, not grudgingly or necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. And here's the promise. And God is able to make what? All grace abound toward you. Sometimes the word grace means money in the Bible. In other passages, 
Paul refers to the Macedonian churches and sometimes to the Christians by using the word grace, saying the grace given to you to share with the other churches. So here he's using the word grace to refer to giving to God. And God will bless you back by his grace and giving you back. Now look at it. And God is able to make all grace to abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every what? Good work. And that's what we've been talking about. Good works in the distributing of our resources to our brethren and by showing hospitality. Obviously, next week we're going to be dealing with hospitality, not today. God's able to make all grace, all resources abound toward you so that what you give will not only fill up, the inventory will fill back up, but he'll give you even more than you give. It always happens in my life. I give and I give and I give even sometimes when it hurts. And I don't have, I give the last penny out of my pocket so often to people. who They look at me and they think, well, you're a pastor, you're a paid professional, you're like a doctor or a lawyer. If they only knew. But God knows. And I don't tell anybody. And God not only replaces it, but gives abundantly more. So that the coffers are filled back up. I'm not only able to continue to pay my bills, but I always have so much extra to do good works with. Just to give it away. And I love giving it away. That's my reward, is the delight and the joy. To just give it away for the glory of God. To see people praise God, to see people thank God, to see people thank me. And then it's an opportunity for me to say, no, thank God. Because behind it all is the one who is the giver of every good gift. And who is that? God. God. He's the giver of every good gift. And especially, he's given us the greatest gift of all, his son. Do we need, really need anything or want anything more than him? Well, only what we need to live. That's about it. Because this world is not our home. We're only passing through. Christ is waiting for his bride. He's waiting for the day when the marriage supper of the Lamb will cause us to celebrate with him in the greatest celebration that history has ever seen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for giving to us in a way that we still cannot measure or comprehend the unfathomable riches and treasures that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You said, He that gave us His Son, shall He not also with Him freely give us all things? We thank You for giving us our Lord Jesus and, and even giving us of this world's good so that we can live comfortably without pain or hunger or rain beating down on our heads. And that we even have enough to give to your work, to spend on things and do good works by that will follow us into the next life. Wow, what an amazing privilege to live our lives in giving, 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 and in serving you so that all of these activities will not be wasted, but, but will all converge and redound to your glory. We praise you for this. We don't even know the, the half of what a blessing it is, Lord, to, to live a life of giving and serving and distributing to the needs of your people. Give us the joy of it, Lord, if we haven't experienced it yet. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.